Why don't we all stand and give the Lord some praise? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. What a wonderful friend you are, Lord. We praise your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise God, praise God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, it's so good to be in God's house tonight. And we're glad that you came to join us in worship here tonight and praise such a worthy King as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of our praise. And uh, some people have told me, I've been told this more than one time, it really bothers me when people get to making too much noise and, uh, and praising God so loud. Well, you don't want to go to heaven because they're going to be praising God. They're going to be shouting and worshiping and praising the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And Brother Larry uh, Landers, you need to call up Mr. Swaggart and tell him in Spanish, La Rocio. La oración cambia las cosas. Prayer changes things. Oh, yes, it does. It changes things. And uh, Brother uh, Graham is here, and he wrote a song, It Ain't Easy, Boy. And uh, it's got a lot of truth. It's not a real dedication song of Christianity, but it's got good meaning, and there's no nothing wrong with listening to it. And... Uh, The Lord has helped me raise up 23 churches in Panama, and I'm getting ready to build church number 24 by the help of the Lord. And somebody called me and said, it must be real easy to get a church going over there in Panama. Well, I reminded them of this song that this guy wrote, It Ain't Easy, Boy. If you're looking for an easy place, you might as well get out now. I was preaching in Ohio, and a young preacher came to me and said, I'm going to quit my job. I'm getting ready to go out full time, and you travel around a lot. You probably know an easy place where I could start. Maybe pastoring would be real easy. And I said, you looking for an easy place? He said, yes. I said, keep your job. Keep your job. There's no easy place because we have an adversary. Now, the Lord does bless us and repay us over and over again, but there's no easy place. Now, Brother Larry, I remember taking you with me in that uh, I believe that a white Ford truck, and I had on the front of it the machine. <laughs> you remember the machine, brother? Oh, that was some truck, and uh, I had a la. Ma- I can't get it in Spanish right now, but anyhow, I had it on, on the front, and this brother Leopoldo came out and said, "What does that mean?" I said, "It means la maquina, the machine." And uh, so uh, we went down in that area, I believe, to visit a preacher by the name of Triego, which is like wheat, and he lived in a place called Maiz, which is corn, and we were down, can you remember that, and uh, we went down there, and I did not know at that time, and neither did Brother Larry know, but he was going to become a renowned missionary in the country of Mexico, oh yes, a lot of people know that Brother Larry Landers works in Mexico, and went uh, from all the way from Monterey clear to the tip of Mexico, preaching the gospel and doing the work for the Lord. And wherever you're working, you say, well, I haven't done much because you haven't got out. You've got to shake loose from all security here at home. You know, some people would go if they could hold on to their security. But you can't hold on to security and materialistic things and put it all in the hands of God. That's just message number one. So we're getting ready to preach to you, and we thank you for the offering and the wonderful food that's been brought in to us. And yesterday, this pastor loosened up his purse strings and took me out for a big old steak. Boy, you know, I do have a type of blood. Joan Vandegrift checked me out, and I've got the type of blood that can, uh, can take red meat, oh yes, and digest it. Oh, so don't worry about feeding me too many steaks. I got the right kind of blood inside my body and the right kind of blood over my soul and my sins. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We love all the people here 
You've been so good to us this week, and it's been a privilege for us to preach for you. First night I preached here, I preached on the saddest road, the saddest road to hell. And I took my text out of Ecclesiastes, where the writer said, So I saw the wicked buried, who had came and gone from the place of the holy. That's the saddest road, to end up in hell, to be here where an altar is, where you can find Jesus. And then I started preaching on my midnights after that. Oh, yes, I remember preaching on midnight and no bread, midnight and no oil. You remember that, don't you? Midnight and no blood, midnight jailbreak, midnight cry. Just come right down the line on the midnights. Well, I finished them up last night, so let us go now to the book of St. Luke's Gospel. St. Luke's Gospel. And I want to tell Christian, I really appreciate him helping me last night. And this saxophone player over here helping me out last night. I appreciate that very much. You know, we got to have some help in the work of the Lord. What kind of church would Brother Steve and Sister Gayla more have if nobody here would do anything? Say, come and sing. No, I'm not going to sing tonight. Come and play the piano, Sister Debbie. No, I'm not playing. And just nobody do anything. Nobody pray. You wouldn't have a church. But you've got to have helpers. And uh, when I tell you that I've raised up uh, 23 churches and getting ready to build number 24, don't think that I'm saying I've did that. It's been God and God's people that's helped me. And just like I was preaching in Taylor Mill, Kentucky, a few months ago, and a man slipped in beside me. And uh, he said, about how much does it cost to build a church over in Panama? And I said, well, the last one was around $12,000. Okay. I said, I'll bring you a check tomorrow night for 12000 And he did. And the, the pastor said he didn't even know he'd give it. says, didn't even dent him. Made no dent in his money. There's people that, there's people that can support the work of God. And Jesus knew that, and he knew the fish that had his, had the money in his mouth, too. And he sent Peter down there and said, the fa- first fish you catch, reach in his mouth. He's got money in there. So I'm wondering if i got any fish out here that's got money. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your offerings. May the Lord bless you. I'm reading from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. This is concerning the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Bible said in verse 32 of the 23rd chapter of Luke, maybe it'd be good if we'd all stand for the reading of the word and then you can be seated for about 30 minutes. I'm going to preach and then I'll be finished thereabouts. Verse 32 says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, There they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hang-railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today... Shalt thou be with me in paradise? You may be seated in the name of the Lord. And I want to preach on one of the greatest trophies of Jesus. 
This is not a fantasy story. This not, did not take place on a television screen. This is a real life happening. It's not a passion play, play by Mel Gibson or anyone else. This was a real incident on a hill outside of Jerusalem. Oh yes, come with me in your minds and let us look upon that hill. Three men are being crucified on three crosses. A thief on the right, a thief on the left, and on the center cross is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. All three men are suffering untold pain. Those thieves were suffering just like Jesus was suffering. They were all in agony and pain. There is mocking and wagging of heads and reviling and ridiculing of the man on the center cross. And they were saying, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Others were saying he saved others, but himself he cannot save. Someone else said he trusted in God. Let him save him now. Hear what I want to tell you tonight. Yes, he was the Son of God. And we read in other places where he presently could call more than 12 legions of the angels. But why did he stay on that cross? Because he loved you and 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 and the whole world. And was willing to die for our sins. Now both thieves mocked him first. You'll find that in the 27th chapter of the book of Matthew verse 44. The Bible calls them thieves. But then one had a change of heart. So I want to preach about the penitent thief. One of the greatest trophies of Jesus. Hear this. I know of no other case that looked more hopeless and desperate than that of this penitent thief. He hang on a cross from which he will never come down alive. He could not lift a hand. He could not even stir a foot. His hours were numbered. His grave was ready for him. If there was ever a soul hanging over the brink of hell, it was the soul of this thief. I wonder what's holding people out. The last time I preached to Brother David Moore, and I love and pray for David Moore, but I preached on what's holding you out of hell. I preached on this text, and I said, Is it the prayers of a mother? Is it the prayers of a father? What's holding you out? Well, I know of no other case that looked more hopeless. Hear me. Some would say this man was too wicked to be saved. Others would say he was too late to pray. But wait, let's see the outcome of the scene. Now you got to understand that there was no music. There was no singers. There was no preachers. Conditions were not conducive for revival. This man saw no scepter in Jesus' hand. This penitent thief saw no royal robes upon him. Neither did he saw, see a royal kingly crown upon his head. But when he looked at the man on the center cross, he recognized him as a king, as Lord. He called him Lord. Oh, yes, he did. He called him Lord. Sure, sure, others called him Lord. Peter, after a divine revelation, called him Lord. And Thomas, after he felt the nail prints in his hands, called him Lord. And Paul, after that bright light shone upon him on Damascus Road and he fell to the ground, he called him Lord. But this man saw none of these things. All he saw was holiness and purity of Jesus at the cross. He was won by the most vital element that you can ever use to win souls. Preachers, listen to me. You must preach the cross. You must preach a Savior that died on the cross. Say, well, how did you win all those souls in Panama and build all those churches? Oh, yes, I teach and preach holiness after they're saved. Hard to clean a fish before you catch him. And it's hard to get people dressed and right and everything before they're saved. But listen to me. You preach the cross first. And then when people come to the cross, their nature is changed. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. 
Now the Bible tells us that Jesus' visage was more mired than any man. Possibly his own mother would not have recognized him because of the terrible condition of his body. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that his body was so beaten that when he hung on the cross, his entrails, his insides was protruding through his rib cage. Why did he suffer? Why did he go through all of that agony? Because he loved a sinful world. Oh, because he loved you. Say, well, not me. I didn't do all that bad. Every one of us has sinned and come short of the glory of God. I've lived with Sister Rich almost 58 years. She's a good woman and a good saint of God. But she sinned. She has sinned. All of us have sinned. Oh, our pastor, a wonderful man as he is, and Sister Gala, wonderful woman as she is, we've all sinned. We needed a Savior. We needed someone that could wash our sins away. Oh, yes. And this thief, he realized when that other thief started mocking, another thief started ridiculing him, this thief started evangelizing. And he rebuked him. And he defended the holiness of Christ. Oh, yes. He said, don't you fear God? Seeing that we're in the same condemnation. And we're receiving our just due, our just reward. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Oh, yes. He believed that Jesus was a king and that he had a kingdom. So he prayed his nine-word prayer. What a prayer. Lord, that's addressing him as the master of his life. Lord, Lord, I want you to remember me. Nine word prayer. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He realized this wasn't the end of this man. Somewhere there he would have a kingdom. And someplace somebody would be in that kingdom. So he said, Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom, and Jesus answered him with nine words, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus received him and pardoned him and cleansed him, justified him freely, raised him up from the gates of hell, and gave him a title to a paradise just because he prayed that nine-word prayer. Oh, what great assurance Jesus gave him. Go over the whole list from Genesis to Revelation and you'll not find no other who had these words spoken to him today. See, I don't believe in eternal security. This man had it for one day. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, yes. He was plucked like a firebrand out of the burning. He got more in that nine-word prayer than he had stolen in a lifetime. He was a thief, and there's no telling how much stuff he had stolen. But in that one little prayer, oh, he received eternal life. Have not I a right to preach to you tonight? By grace are you saved through faith. Oh, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Oh, yes, that is the gospel story. I used to think when I go up to preach to those Indians who couldn't read nor write, who didn't know very much. Brother Moore's been with me to some of those places, Brother Moore Sr. I used to think I had to some way try to expand their minds so they could grasp the gospel message. And then I realized they was not saved by in- intellect. They were only saved by grace. And if I could get them to believe in, in the grace of God. Oh, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And if I could just get them to believe in grace, they could be saved. This thief was never baptized. wonder what the oneness thinks about that. They teach that salvation only comes when you're baptized in water in Jesus' name. Well, if we got any oneness here, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. Your doctrine's wrong. This thief was never baptized. Never belonged to a visible church. Never took the Lord's Supper, the communion. 
Oh, hallelujah. Listen to me. He never dropped a dime into an offering plate. No, he didn't. But he had a faith that was stronger than death. And Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Then when Jesus entered heaven, you see, you must understand that before, after Jesus' death, he descended first into the lower parts. That's when he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's when he changed the bosom of Abraham, oh yes, over to the paradise of God, is whenever he descended into the lower parts. When he came back up, he had captivity, those that were in captivity with him. That's when the, the faith of just men were made perfect. Now listen to this old white-headed preacher. The thief was never baptized, never took the Lord's Supper. But did this thief, ha- thief have any works? Well, Jesus took him to paradise. Then when Jesus entered heaven, he never asked uh, who, if he could bring him. And the thief never asked for temporary relief. He wanted something eternal. So he had a trophy. And there's an ex-con in heaven tonight that knows more about the suffering of the cross than any theologian that's written books about the cross. He knows more about the cross than me and Brother Moore know. Oh, because he'd been on that cross. Oh, yes, he was delivered from that cross. Yes, he's a smart man. He knows about salvation. And go over this whole list. Jesus took him to paradise. And when he entered to heaven, I'm just wondering if there were people standing out, angels and others standing out looking. And look, Jesus is coming. Who's this he's got? Who does he have with? Abraham? Maybe Isaac? Maybe Jacob? Maybe Isaiah? Maybe Jeremiah? No. He's got a thief. But wait a minute. That thief was saved. And Brother Addis, that great preacher of bygone days, he's still alive, but I understand he's not able to preach. But he preached. He said one man told him, said, I'm going to wait. And like that dying thief... I'm going to wait till my last hours, and then I'm going to say, Lord, remember me. And Brother Addis said, listen, that man was a dying thief, and you're a living thief. said, every day you walk away from God, you're taking the grace of God for granted, and you're stealing and transgressing on the grace of God. Listen to me, I'll soon be finished. This thief, he entered heaven. He was a trophy. Oh, yes. On the morning on his way to hell, that evening, that night in paradise. But there was another thief there. There wasn't just one thief being crucified, there were two. And this other thief had the same privilege, the same opportunity. There was just one dividing factor. This one thief that was saved believed in that cross. And that man hanging on that cross... And that put him into heaven. Oh, I believe angels stand in reception as Jesus brings this thief with him. Then said Jesus unto him, then said they unto Jesus, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Yes, our faith is what makes a difference. You see, the Bible said this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now this thief was the first man under the new blood covenant to be saved. For where a testament, according to Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also be of a necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, has no strength at all while the testator liveth. Well, Jesus died before the thief did. They came to break Jesus' bones to hasten his death, and they marvel that he was already dead. Oh, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and me to the world. Wherefore, 
Also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. There is no easy way. No, no, there's no royal road to just wait till you die and then cross on over and go into heaven. You need to count the cost tonight. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his life for us on the cross of Calvary. I would have liked to have been there when the angel saw him coming, bringing this thief. Oh, yes, sinner, this thief indicts you and I if we're not saved. He indicts each sinner, for he repented hanging on nails. And whenever sinner gets to the judgment... The thief is going to say, you had an altar. You had carpet to kneel in. You had wonderful pews to sit upon. You had a preacher up there preaching to you and singer singing to you. But I repented hanging there on nails. Whew. I don't know whether it does anything for you or not. But that lets me know how easy God has made it for us in this day to get right with God. There's no use of anyone going to hell. Oh, no, Jesus died for our sins. And God forbid that we should glory in anything else but the cross. I have great respect for our pastor, Brother Steve Moore. I have respect for all of the wonderful people coming here. But you're not what is holding me. I'm clinging to that old rugged cross. Oh, yes. I've even had a few people to tell me, Brother Rich, you've inspired us to live for God. I must tell you, I did not save not one soul. I have preached the way of salvation, but I haven't saved one soul. And I want to tell you this story that you've heard me tell many times. But when I took the church in Orville, California, they said that they starved the last preacher out that was there. And I said, they're not going to starve this preacher out. I know too much to be starved out. Yes, I do. I know too how to do too many things. And then my church board said, our other pastor worked and even worked some on Sunday, and we don't want you working. Well, woe be to the pastor that work on Sunday. Nobody's saying anything. Or anybody else for us, that goes. It's God's day. Don't you go over there and work on Sunday. Oh, yes. Your job demands you to work on Sunday. Quit your job and get you a job. If you had to flip hamburgers at McDonald's, don't stay off of that Sunday work and give that day to the Lord. Boy, I'm not getting but one amen. That's from Larry. Anybody else say amen? amen. Getting a few here. Hallelujah. That's why so many places do not recognize the Lord's day. John the Revelator said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. But we've taken the Lord's Day and turned it into a holiday or a day of of, uh, feasting and a day of doing other things. But, oh, I wish we would understand that God wants us to set aside that day for our worship. And we need to be in the house of the Lord. Anyhow, we moved there, and they told me they'd starve the last preacher out. So... I saw some pasture land down there, and uh, I've inquired who that pasture belonged to and found out. They told me his old man up on the hill, and I went up there to see a man by the name of Cy Perkins, and I, he said, I'll rent that pasture to you down there, so I've got me some calves and put in there so I could have some of them steaks I like to eat, and I put some calves in there, and uh, but anyhow... I was up there one day talking to Cy Perkins, and I started to leave, and God and the Holy Ghost prompted me. And I said, Cy, I want to tell you something before I leave here. You've been good to me the few short time I've known you. But did you know that it's appointed unto men once to die, and after death the judgment? And I said, you're going to go to the judgment of Cy if you haven't given your heart to the Lord. And boy, he got upset. He raised a cane up like this and said, get out that door, and don't you ever come back. Well, I got out the door. Can you believe I got brave enough in about a week, week and a half to go back up there? I did. 
I went back up and knocked on the door. Cy came to the door. He said, Rich, I told you to get out and don't ever come back. Now here you're back again. Get off of my property. Get out of that door and don't ever come back. Well, I thought it's too good an opportunity here with this man to let it pass by. I've got pasture rented from him, so i got to go pay him the rent. And that would be a good time to talk to him again about his soul. I went back up there. He said, now, Rich, I've liked you. Ever since I first met you, I liked you. But I said, you are really getting on my nerves. I don't want you up here no more. If you want to pay the rent, you come. And my wife will take the rent from you, but I don't want you here anymore. Well, saw this sign up, fatted calf for sale, and come to find out size the one that had that big old beef for sale. And since I like steak so well, I just uh, drove up there, and I said, I uh, asked his wife where Cy was. She said, he's down in the pasture. And said, I think he knows you're a preacher now. And said, he hates preachers. Said, whatever you do, don't you tell him you're a preacher. Well, he got up there, and uh, I went over and looked at his calf, and I know my beef now. Well, the more that old steer came up like this, fastened in a stall, come up like this, and then went down in the middle, right over where them humps are, where you get them ribeye steaks, right there, right on each side of that backbone. And I know my meat. And so I talked to him about that. Uh, calf and he said what do you do for a living and I either had to tell him the truth and I knew I could outrun him because he's on a at that time he's like me he's getting old and on a cane I said you know that white church out there on the highway Trinity Holiness Church I'm the pastor out there and his wife heard me telling him that and she got a little shook up afraid of what he might do he said so you're a preacher and I said yes so I'm going to knock $35 off of that beef for you. Now, God can give you favor. Oh, yes. I bought his beef, and whenever I got it back from the, had him cut it up and put it in the, the locker room, and when I got back, the steaks is so good, grain fed. I took him up a couple steaks for a peace offering and took it up and gave to him. And I started talking to him again about the Lord. And about his appointment with God. He said, out that door, man. I don't want to hear that stuff. Get out of my way. Get out of my house. But I went back again. Talked to him a little while again. And then I told him as I was leaving. I said, Sigh, don't you forget that it's appointed unto men once to die. And after death, the judgment. Well, Sister Rich and I went somewhere to preach a revival. I don't know where. We came home, and we hadn't been there but a short time, and a nurse called us from the hospital and said, the Perkins family has made a call for you. They've got a man in here called Cy Perkins, and he's asking for you. I said, me? You know, in my, set, in my mind, me? I said, okay, we'll be up there soon. And Sister Rich and I got dressed for the hospital and went up there hurriedly. We got up there, and they took me back where old Cy was lying there on the bed, had that monitor on him, and had an oxygen mask on him. And when I laid my hand on him, I said, Cy, I'm rich. I'm here to see you. Much to their dismay, he lifted that oxygen mask and said, Rich, I knew you'd come. Rich, I knew you'd come. And I said, Yes, I'm here. He said, I don't know how to pray to your God. And said, I'll never go to your church. So I was hoping that I would, but I don't think I'll ever go. But he said, uh, I'd like to have your God. I said, only one way to do it. You've got to repent of your sins. Pray. And he said, I don't know how to pray. So if people don't know how to pray, now don't you frown on this. If people don't know how to pray, you need to teach them how. That's what Jesus did. Even Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. And so I started teaching him, praying with him the sinner prayer. After a while, I 
He didn't need me no more. He was praying on his own, seeking God. And finally, the nurses come in and said, you're disturbing Mr. Perkins. Said the monitor's going up and down. You're, and he needs his oxygen mask on. And I took the floor at that time. Already had it standing up. But I said to that nurse, I said, this man, she told me how critical he was. He was in intensive care. I said, this man needs prayer. And I'm here to pray for him. You're welcome to pray with us, ma'am. But if you're not going to pray with us, you go on, because I'm praying for this man before I leave here. Sometimes you got to be bold when you serve God. And I started praying for Sai. And she left out. Wasn't too long till he lifted that mask again. And we started praying more. And finally he said, it's, he's done it, Rich. He's forgiven me my sin, Rich. He's done it, Rich. And then he said words that still ring in my heart and soul. He said, I wanted to get out of here and go with you out to your little church out there on the highway. But said, I'll never get out of here, Rich. But said, I'll go with you in the big church up there. And that's the last words he said and went out here to meet God. You know who I'm going to meet up there? Cy Perkins, I believe he made it. If God would hear the prayer of this sinner that said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy, thy kingdom, he'll hear your prayer too if you're here with sin in your life. Well, it's the old rugged cross. Sister Debbie, would you come on to the piano? I want to sing a little bit. Not me, but others out there. You know, Jesus died before that thief died. They marvel that he was so soon dead. Some said it just was soul sleep. No, it was not just soul sleep. Jesus died. He died until the birds quit singing. He died until the sun quit shining. It got dark. And he died until the rocks and the mountains began to quake. Oh, yes. He died until that centurion. He didn't realize it, but he's reading this. Read an obituary and said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And brothers and sisters, I believe that we can be saved. I would like to have it go down on my record that I preach the truth, the Word of God for lost humanity. If this man that I preached, read about could repent hanging on nails, why can't people repent in such a comfortable atmosphere? We had a man come down to this altar, what was that, Sunday or Monday night? And s since his transportation is left, I don't know what that man's name is, you know. Mike, Mike came down here to pray. And the people he were coming with has went out of the area, I understand, for right now. And he don't have no transportation. But he did lift his hands right there on that altar and said, Thank you, God, for saving my soul. To me, he said, Well, it wasn't much happened in the revival if that soul got right with God. Brother, that is another trophy. That is another trophy. And. Uh, that lady that my wife and Gaithan Graham worked on named Hong. And she, I don't know where she's from Hong Kong, China or where, but her name was Hong. And Shirley, we was over there and Gaithan started playing the piano and Shirley started singing. He touched me. I could tell God was touching Hong's life. She was a Buddhist. Buddha. And God can't do nothing with a Buddha. He can save them if they'll repent. So I have a lot of people, well, I, I, I'm a Catholic. I said, God will save you and forgive you for being a Catholic. You don't believe you can? I can show you people that's been converted from the Catholic religion. Sure, he'll save a Catholic. Anyone that will repent. Well, Shirley started working with her and she was a friend of John Gaither that's here tonight, so he knows I'm telling you the truth. 
And Shirley started talking to her about receiving Jesus Christ. And she had many gods. She believed in many gods. But on her dying hour, she renounced all other gods and said, I claim Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. What more can you do? You draw in your last breath and you confess Christ as your Savior. Hey, you and you, your next step is going to be inside the gates of pearl. And so Gaithan, being a good friend of this lady, Hong, he wrote a, he didn't write a song. He com- recomposed a song, I'll meet you in the morning, just inside the eastern gates. Quite a story there, Gaithan. If anybody wants that story, you can get it to them, can't you? Yeah, I'll meet you in the morning. How many wants to meet me in the morning? I'm go- I'm getting old now. I'll be 79 just in a, less than a, about a month and a half. I'm going to be 79. I'm planning on going to heaven. That's my goal. Oh, yes, I know you see the flesh. and You see, I am subject to mistakes. And listen to me. Let no man say, you know. Let no man think that he's not subject to mistakes. For when a man thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I'm not planning on falling. But if I do, get me to the church where there's some holiness people that will have some compassion on me. And pray with me and say, Don, you need to repent again and get right with God. You failed. Don't just shove me aside. That's what's happened to some. We had some leave this church too. I want every one of them back. If they'll repent and come back right, we want them here. Amen? You got to say amen to that. Hallelujah. We want them to be in the house of God. I've had them to walk out. I had one man I was preaching, walked right down, took his pocket knife out of his pocket. I don't know what this meant. Cut a button off his shirt and said, you get the button tonight. Handed me that button. And when he got to the door, said, I came to hear some preaching, not a bunch of raving. And about that time, some old brother over in another corner said, rave on, brother, rave on. Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm preaching right on, preaching the plan of salvation. They call Paul a babbler. And I say, Babylon, oh wise babbler, tell people the way of salvation. Would you stand with me, please? Let's sing one verse, and then I'm going to open the altar. Sing it with us. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame oh I love that old cross and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a Oh, hallelujah. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Do you really cherish that old cross? here tonight and you feel a tug at your heart strings you feel your need of praying and asking the Lord to help you our altars are open good people are here that will pray with you why don't you come and just kneel right here at this altar and surrender your life to Jesus Christ 
Say, it's too hard. No, all you got to do is say, Lord, I want you to come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. Seems humorous, but one old, one fellow said, come to this old preacher. And the old preacher told him, said, confess your sins. He stalled a little bit. And the preacher told him again, said, confess your sins. And finally he said, I, I can't remember them. The old preacher said, guess at them. He said, he got them right every time. We know what we've been doing that's wrong. You know what you've been doing that's wrong. You don't have to guess at them. You know what you've been doing that's wrong. If there's anyone here that you've got any sin in your life, we're not condemning you. We're showing you a better way. A way with a clean heart, a clean conscience, a conscience that's void of offense toward God and toward man. Is there anyone want to come and pray with us? Ask the Lord to help you tonight. We're waiting on you. Come right on right now. In Jesus' name. Then I open the altars. And I ask everyone that will. To come and pray with us. And let's have a season of prayer. Thank you, Brother Moore. Really looking forward to hearing that good message you got stored up for in the morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come right on and help us. Oh, that old rugged cross yes. so, so despised by the world It has, has a wondrous a wondrous attraction for oh, me. Oh, hallelujah. Left his glory above Hallelujah. To Come on now and let's ask God to help us. Ask God to help you to present Christ Jesus and the cross to someone else. To use you. To use you in his works. To use you. Oh God, touch our people Today, today Shalt thou be with me in paradise Lord, there is a place Yes, Lord. A wondrous attraction. Beauty I see. Oh, yes. For it was, was on that old, that old cross. Hallelujah. Jesus suffered. Suffered and died. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Son of God.
What a trophy. And what a trophy. Change it some day for a crown. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. To oh, the old Jesus. Rugged cross. I will never. Never to be true. Be true. Yes. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Yes. Then he'll call me someday. Me someday. serve you to the end how much further I must go I do not know 